Throughout history, the technology of war has continually changed, but the art of war, how a commander commands, has remained more or less the same. Nations have gone out of existence because of their failure to understand what war is all about, including its diplomatic, economic, and social elements. A great commander, one way or another, always seems to understand how all these forces are interrelated. A strip of land on Turkey's Mediterranean coast. Thousands of people drive past every day without giving it a second glance. But here, 23 centuries ago, Alexander the Great led his men to victory against an army that outnumbered him by at least six to one. This, the Battle of Issus, changed the future of the Western world. Alexander of Macedonia is perhaps the greatest commander in human history. In little more than a decade, he created a vast empire, stretching from Greece through present-day Turkey, Egypt, the Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and into India. He had a persona, an image, a charisma, if you like, which somehow has come down the ages almost undimmed. Now, in part, of course, he worked upon this himself. He was undoubtedly a great publicist of his achievements and so forth. The very fact he named so many cities Alexandria around the empire proves that very point, I think. But he has a certain, I don't know, tremendous romantic quality. And the fact, of course, that he dies so young, with so much achieved, puts him into a special category. Alexander was born in 356 BC in the kingdom of Macedonia in northern Greece. His father was Macedonia's king, Philip II. Philip was a man of war whose life was spent conquering new territories and overrunning the city-states of Greece. It was during these turbulent years that Alexander's character was formed. There came a day when Philip was brought a horse named Bucephalus. The king and his friends went to watch the horse's trial and came to the conclusion that it was wild and quite unmanageable. But Alexander went up to Bucephalus, took hold of the bridle and turned him towards the sun for he'd noticed that the horse was shying at the shape of his own shadow in front of him. Then, he vaulted safely onto his back. His father wept for joy, and when Alexander dismounted, he said, My boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambition. Macedonia is too small for you. The philosopher Aristotle was then paid by Philip to teach the 13-year-old Alexander art, literature, and music. After three years, aged 16, he returned to the royal palace. On one occasion, some ambassadors from the king of Persia arrived in Macedon, and since Philip was absent, Alexander received them in his place. He talked freely with them and quite won them over. 
not only by the friendliness of his manner, but also because he didn't trouble them with any childish or trivial inquiries, but questioned them about the distances they'd traveled by road, the nature of the journey through Persia, the character of the king, his experience in war, and the military strength of the Persians. Philip now taught his son how to fight. Alexander learned quickly, and together they led the army in the conquest of Greece. A king such as Philip had many enemies. When Alexander was only 20, his father was assassinated. In an atmosphere of suspicion and recrimination, Alexander became the new king. He had invincible power of endurance, a keen intellect. He was brave and adventurous and hungry for fame. In arming and equipping troops, he was masterly. Noble indeed was his power of inspiring his men, of filling them with confidence. Doubtless in the passion of the moment Alexander sometimes heard, it is true that he took some steps towards pomp and arrogance. But after all, he was young. Having secured his position, the ambitious young king looked east to Persia, the mightiest empire on earth. After months of preparation, he and his army of 35,000 men set out. You've got the professional soldiers, you've got the royal court, you've also got the wagons raising enormous clouds of dust. You've got herds of animals being driven along for food. You've got the female hangers-on who attach themselves to this increasingly successful army. You've got the merchants, the traders, trying to cash in on this great economic opportunity. You've got a diverse assembly of intellectuals, experts, who are also cashing in on the gravy train. You've got the people who are measuring the roads along which they're marching. You've got an official historian. You've got poets. You've got people interested in botany who will record the various new species of plants that they come across. You've got geographers. You've got people interested in mineral wealth when they come across bitumen in, in, in Iraq. This is something which they, they comment on. They, investigate it, they, they set a light to it, pour it on some poor unfortunate slave, and set it alight. When he was at leisure, his first act after rising was to sacrifice to the gods after which he had breakfast. The rest of the day would be spent in hunting or administering justice, planning military affairs or reading. If he were on a march which required no great haste, he'd practice archery as he rode, or mounting and dismounting from a moving chariot, and he often hunted foxes or birds. He sat long over his wine because of his fondness for conversation. And although at other times his company was delightful and his manner full of charm beyond that of any prince of his age, yet when he was drinking, he would sometimes become offensively arrogant not only give way to boasting, but also be led on by his flatterers. In Babylon, the Persian king Darius III had been informed of this impudent young man invading his empire, but expected the nobility in the western provinces to stop him. But at the river Granicus, Alexander faced the army these nobles had assembled. With courage and swiftness, he crushed it. But Alexander faced another threat. The powerful Persian fleet could easily invade Greece and Macedonia in his absence. He had to destroy it. As his own navy was no match for the enemy, he fought on land. 
By occupying key ports, he cut off the fleet's supplies and neutralized its power. Alexander was now free to head inland and seek out Darius. Darius had used his time wisely, raising troops from his many provinces and hiring mercenaries from Greece. A huge force of up to 200,000 men gathered at Babylon. Since the future of his throne was at stake, Darius decided to lead the army personally. The Persian king, accompanied by his wife, mother, children and harem, set out from Babylon to confront the young Macedonian. As Darius went north, Alexander headed south and brought his 35,000 men through the Taurus Mountains and into the fertile plains on the Mediterranean coast. Here, he replenished his stocks. Alexander did live off the land. He lived off the well-organized system of supplies that supported the Persian provincial capitals. And Alexander has the military muscle to grab these, to claim them for himself, to exploit them. And that's how his army is, is, is able to keep on the march. It would have been very difficult at some points for his army to go back on their, go back on their tracks because there wouldn't have been any food. He has grabbed what there was and the army has eaten it. He's got to go on. Having approached each other at the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean, the two armies set up camp either side of the Aminus Mountains. Darius had chosen to fight on a wide open plain where his numerical advantage could be decisive. There he waited, but Alexander failed to appear. With winter approaching and supplies running low for his large army, Darius had little choice but to break camp and go in search of his enemy. Alexander began to march along the coast. But unknown to both, as Darius went north, Alexander passed him on the other side of the mountains, going south. Reaching the village of Issus, Alexander established a camp for his wounded and sick troops before moving on. When Darius reached the coast, he was surprised to discover that Alexander's army had already passed that point. Hurrying after him, he arrived at Issus, where he had the hands of Alexander's sick troops cut off so they would never fight again. Then he continued south until stopping on the northern bank of the river Panaris. Alexander was amazed when informed that the Persians were only a day's march behind him. But unperturbed, he simply turned his army around. Alexander's uh, moves and decisions before the Battle of Issus show him emerging as a great commander. First of all is his total determination to force a major battle as the only way in which he is going to get uh, the results he requires in the particular campaign, and even though he is facing, of course, a much larger opponent. But also a point before the Battle of Issus I particularly admire is the way in which he was not thrown by the sudden arrival of totally unexpected intelligence to the effect that Darius and his army was behind him rather than in front of him. Now, that is usually a very unfortunate circumstance to find the enemy operating on your lines of communication. Alexander, though, is a kind of man who welcomed this opportunity and immediately set about to make the most of the chain situation. From dawn the next day, Alexander marched until he could see his formidable opposition on the horizon. He was outnumbered six to one, perhaps more. Darius had raised a huge force of approximately 10,000 cavalry and 200,000 infantry. Alexander had over 5,000 cavalry, but only 30,000 infantry. He was nevertheless sure that before the day was out, his opponent's army would have been destroyed. 
The Battle of Issus changed the course of history. Along this stretch of river, how was Alexander able to defeat a force so much larger than his own? Alexander owed a great debt to his father, for Philip had trained his young recruits to march with speed and fight with skill. He created a year-round professional army without equal. We've got organized armies for the very first time in history. When we say for the very first time, of course, I'm talking about a very broad sweep of period. The ancient Egyptians, the Hittites and others, of course, had armies before Alexander's day. But there's a certain sophistication beginning to develop, which is going to continue in much the same general format for the next thousand years or so from Alexander onwards. There are roles for soldiers, there are cavalry, there are infantry, there are artillerymen firing the rudimentary artillery of their period, there are supply trains. All the requirements of armies, right the way down to Napoleon at least, are present in Alexander's army. Horses and men gleaming, not with gold, not with multicolored clothes, but with iron and bronze. It was an army ready to stand its ground and follow its leader, and not overloaded with numbers and baggage. An army eagerly watching, not just for a signal from Alexander, but even for a nod. Any location suffice for their camp, any food for their provisions. In addition to the cavalry and frontline infantry, both sides also had slingers, archers, and javelin throwers, whose role was to weaken the enemy before the battle began in earnest. But the core of an army was its infantry, and Alexander had another advantage in that the Persians used a traditional method of fighting. It's strictly speaking a very defensive system, where you've got heavily armed infantrymen armed with a spear and a round shield and they stand shoulder to shoulder and they fight using the spear overhand fighting between the darts that are left between the round shields it's very much a defensive formation the macedonians had developed an entirely different type of formation which was essentially aggressive this the soldiers were armed with a very very long pike 20 feet long which they held in two hands underarm and because of the length of the pike, the points of the first five rows of spears all stuck out of the front of the, of the phalanx. And when they charged, the other side had to get beyond 15 feet of points before they could actually reach the first person in the phalanx. And the phalanx literally ran across them and ran them down like a tank. Having brought an army to the site of battle, the key to success often lay in the manner in which the troops were deployed. Darius felt confident in his numerical superiority. He established his infantry in a defensive position on the edge of the steeply banked river, then massed virtually all of his 10,000 cavalry by the sea. This cavalry was to launch an all-out strike across the shallow river mouth and encircle the Macedonians from behind. I think Darius reckoned that he could deliver a knockout punch with his cavalry located on his right wing down by the beach, that they could sweep, they could sweep through the enemy cavalry opposed to them and then roll up the battle line of the Macedonians from there. I think he I think that Darius thought about deploying his army, and deployed it quite sensibly. The fact that he didn't win the battle was because he, he was fighting against a man whose military genius was 
unsurpassed. Alexander now deployed his army. Despite being outnumbered, the narrowness of the plain, only two miles from mountains to sea, allowed him to form an unbroken line of troops along the entire length of the river. Alexander had seen where Darius intended to attack and encircle him, and so he sent as much cavalry as possible to strengthen that wing and hold off the Persians. But to win the battle, he would have to launch a successful attack of his own. He saw that the Persian wing by the mountains was weak. If his cavalry could break the enemy lines at this point, it could make a direct assault on Darius himself. The king was the heart of the army, and if Alexander could kill or capture him, the massive force he faced would almost certainly collapse. In an ancient battle, the position of honor was always on the right-hand side. The cream of your army took up position on the right-hand side. In a phalanx, the commander of the phalanx takes up his position on the right-hand side. This is the position of honor, and you work downwards in rating towards the left. Now, during the period leading up to Alexander's conquest of Persia, there had been attempts to mash your cream on one side, to break the enemy's wing on that side, and this is, in fact, what Alexander is doing. He is charging with his cavalry against one side, shattering the, the cohesion of the army on that side, and therefore, to a certain extent, make it much easier for his infantry to come into action. He takes a very considerable risk in this personal leadership. If Alexander had been killed, I mean, so important was his position in his army, he, he was irreplaceable. But he realizes that to win all, he must sometimes risk all. That includes his person. But since he only does it with very careful preparation, it shows the greatness of his command. Well, I think we got distinguished between being authoritarian and autocratic. People confuse these two things. They're almost the absolute opposite. Authoritarian personalities tend to be rigid, closed-minded, obsessive, mean, desperately inhibited, particularly inhibiting their aggressive and sexual drives and so forth, unimaginative, conservative with a small c, conventional, conforming, and Alexander, like most great military commanders, didn't suffer from those defects of character. His age gave added luster to his achievements, for though hardly old enough for such undertakings, he was well up to them. There are things generally regarded as rather unimportant, but which are appreciated by soldiers. The fact that he exercised with his men, that he made his appearance little different from an ordinary citizen's, that he had the energy of a soldier, these characteristics, whether they were natural or consciously cultivated, had made him, in the eyes of his men, as much an object of affection as of awe. The two armies stared at one another. The fields were crammed with men who had walked for weeks through strange lands to face an unknown enemy. Now, they prepared to fight each other. Many battles, then and now, are won or lost before they begin. Troops have to be willing to fight, and if necessary, die. Many were scared, soiled with fear. It was the commander and his officers who had to encourage them. Before the first arrow left its bow, the first stone its sling, the discipline and determination of the troops could decide the outcome of this battle. Alexander sent for his officers and appealed to them for confidence and courage in the coming fight. Remember, he said, to preserve discipline in the hour of danger, to advance in utter silence and when the moment comes to roar out and put the fear of God into the enemy's hearts. Remember, upon the conduct of each depends the fate of all. 
Our enemies are men who for centuries have lived soft and luxurious lives. We of Macedonia have trained in the hard school of danger and war. And what of the two men in supreme command? They have Darius. You have Alexander. I think that the thing that we, as soldiers, most admire about Alexander is his, his courage. And I don't just mean by that his physical courage, but his physical and his moral courage. Um, he was a, a very brave man. He was wounded by almost every weapon of war that was available at that time. Um, he quite literally led from the front. Um, uh, he was the first over the wall um, in, in his uh, assaults on cities. Um, he uh, endured uh, by a deliberate act of will all the hardships which his soldiers endured. He would pour away his water if, his, if he knew his soldiers had no water themselves. So he was um, physically a very tough, um, very driven and a very courageous man. Success had bred in him both a fearlessness and the belief that he was divinely blessed. He sought glory in battle, for he was convinced that in glory lay immortality. Alexander is the end of a line. He's the end of a line. He is the last of the great generals who actually leads a charge. It is something that historians, even a few ancient historians, have criticised, is leading the charge. Notice the other ones who are mentioned with Alexander, people like Pyrrhus, Hannibal, Caesar, they never lead a charge. They always command from behind the line so that they can see what's going on and make necessary changes to compensate for where they're being defeated and where they're winning and so on. This, of course, Alexander couldn't do. There is always that element in any great general, the idea that he can't fail. The gods are with him, and therefore he can do anything he likes, and it will work. This sort of supreme self-confidence. I will charge, and because I'm Alexander the Great, I will win. Greek philosophers debated whether Alexander was truly great or whether it was all down to luck, and they, they, they argued the toss on either side, but if it was all down to luck, then one might have expected to see one or two other people managing to do what Alexander did. But if you look at other great commanders in antiquity, someone like Hannibal comes nearest to him and he ultimately loses, whereas Alexander never lost. Alexander set himself incredible goals, challenges, competitions to be heroic, and he surmounted these, he achieved them. Alexander faced the biggest challenge of his life. From his position on the right wing at the head of his elite cavalry, he looked down the ranks of his army. Despite the numerical odds he faced, he felt confident of victory. Suddenly, the battle began. Alexander launched his attack. The Persian archers and infantry buckled in the face of his fierce onslaught. At the same time, Darius's mass of cavalry by the sea launched their assault. But Alexander had sent enough reinforcements to prevent that wing from breaking. As the cavalrys had engaged, the Macedonian phalanx had begun its attempt to cross the shallow river. The banks and water were serious obstacles. The fighting became confused and desperate. 
The blood really flowed, for the two lines were so closely interlocked that they were striking each other's weapons with their own and driving their blades into their opponents' faces. It was now impossible for the timid and the cowardly to remain inactive. Foot against foot, they were virtually engaging in single combat, standing in the same spot until they could make further room for themselves by winning the fight. Only by bringing down his opponent could each man advance. But exhausted as they were, they were continually being met by a fresh adversary, and the wounded could not retire from the battle as on other occasions, because the enemy were bearing down on them in front, while their own men were pushing from behind. Alexander, having smashed the Persian wing by the hills, turned towards Darius. Persian infantry scattered before Alexander's charge, but Darius's personal bodyguard fought almost to the last man. The Persian king, believing his life to be in danger, turned and fled. The Persian army, as Alexander had predicted, lost heart and turned to follow. An army is at its most vulnerable in retreat, and in the ensuing confusion, thousands upon thousands of Persians were trampled underfoot by their own troops or cut down by Macedonians in bloody pursuit. Darius's tent, which was full of many treasures, luxurious furniture and lavishly dressed servants, had been set aside for Alexander himself. As soon as he arrived, he unbuckled his armor and went to the bath, saying, Let us wash off the sweat of battle in Darius's bath. No, in Alexander's bath now, remarked one of his companions. The conqueror takes over the possessions of the conquered, and they shall be called his. When Alexander entered the bathroom, he saw the basins, the pitchers, the baths themselves, and the caskets all made of gold and elaborately carved, and noticed that the whole room was marvelously fragrant with spices and perfumes. He turned to his companions and remarked, So this, it seems, is what it is to be a king. Among the prisoners were Darius's mother, wife, and children. They expected to be raped and killed, but Alexander informed them that on the contrary, they would receive the respect due to royalty. Then he concerned himself with his own men. By order of Alexander, all the dead were buried with their arms and equipment on the day after the battle, and their parents and children in Macedonia were granted immunity from local taxes. For his wounded, he showed deep concern. He visited them all and examined their wounds, asking each man how and in what circumstances his wound was received allowing him to tell his story and exaggerate as much as he pleased. First of all, it established him definitely as a very high-level commander. It might have been luck up to this particular time, purely, but now he has shown himself as a commander of great flexibility and adaptability, capable of defeating an enemy many times his own size. It also brings out a side of him which we do not always stress, and that, of course, is the chivalrous nature of the man and the way he treated the Persian royal family. 
But that must be balanced, of course, against the total ruthlessness with which he pursued and indeed cut down many, many of the rank and file of the Persian army. So you can say he shows a chivalrous instinct towards very important people, but as far as destroying the enemy's army, his main purpose, that he is absolutely ruthlessly determined to achieve. From a safe distance, Darius sent a message offering all of his empire west of the river Euphrates in return for peace. Advised by his leading general Parmenio to accept, Alexander replied that if he were Parmenio, he would, but he was Alexander and would not. Instead, he methodically continued down the coast to finish off the Persian fleet by capturing their remaining Mediterranean ports. No city successfully resisted him. His opponents, unless they were politically valuable, were either crucified or sold into slavery. In northern Egypt, at the mouth of the Nile, he established a new port, Alexandria. Then he headed east to pursue Darius. He caught up with him at Galgamela. Darius had lost many of his finest soldiers at Issus and was at heart a beaten man. In the ensuing battle, Alexander defeated him once again. There would be no further conflicts. Darius was murdered by his own officers. Alexander consolidated his victories by securing the loyalty of those he had defeated. Provincial governors kept their posts if they accepted his rule. Persian soldiers were drafted into the army. Babylon became his empire's capital. He encouraged his soldiers to marry Persian women. He himself, although he had a lifelong male companion, married Darius's daughter. The masters, he declared, were not to feel superior to the mastered. In contrast to previous Greeks, whose attitude towards the Persians was one of contempt, Alexander showed considerable respect for them. He respected the royal women whom he captured at Issus, treating them with great chivalry so that they adored him for the rest of their lives. Darius's mother committed suicide after Alexander's death. But equally more importantly, he exploited the Persian men whom he increasingly captured. He got them onto his side. He got the Persian nobility who could administer provinces onto his side. And through the nobility, he would get the lesser nobility. He would get the rank and file of the cavalry of the Persian infantry onto his, onto his side so that he could use them to control Persia in his own interests. Alexander was not content with Darius's empire. He was still only in his 20s and thirsted after further exploration and conquest. His teacher Aristotle had taught Alexander that the world extended from Europe to India. His ambition would not be satisfied until all this known world was under his control. For the next five years, he led his men ever further east, fighting as much against nature as the guerrilla warfare of hostile tribes. Every challenge was met with innovation and tenacity. Mountain strongholds were scaled using ropes Rivers were crossed on inflated animal skins. Nothing, and no one could defeat him. And all the while, as he ventured further from Macedonia, he never failed to secure his lines of supply, leaving in his path many more cities in his name. In 327 BC, age 29, he crossed the mountains into India. Alexander's veterans now felt that they had been pushed too far. They were anxious to get home and enjoy their newfound wealth and status. These predominantly Mediterranean soldiers had never experienced a monsoon before and were disheartened by the continuous rain. He was forced to turn 
and march back to Babylon. Still restless, he began to plan new campaigns in Arabia and North Africa. But in June 323 BC, aged only 32, weakened by wounds, fever, possibly even poisoned, he suddenly died. He was brave and noble, but he could be ruthless and tyrannical. Even within his own inner court, those he suspected of treachery were put to death. Among them, his leading general, Parminio, and his personal historian. Despite this, he never lost the love and loyalty of his soldiers. They were willing to follow him almost to the ends of the earth. Alexander's ability to inspire men is a very, very important thing. But he took on his father's army, which was a totally professional, thoroughly well-trained army, with much more experience than he had. And he must have relied very heavily on their experience. So it is, as I say, difficult to assess. His main thing is his own personality, which could make men follow him, and his ability to make quick decisions. It is interesting how many Later commanders regard Alexander as the great example in which they try to model themselves. Julius Caesar, for example, in particular. I wonder why that was. Well, from, in my opinion, first of all, it was the sheer size of his achievement. This huge empire carved out from a very small army all the way from Macedonia and Greece to the northwestern areas of India. It is simply a boggling concept. You only have to look at the map to see that. And secondly, I'm sure future commanders were fascinated by how young he was when he achieved all these great affairs. Caesar, I remember, bemoaned the fact that he was only beginning at 40 uh, to have a chance to make a mark upon his times, whereas, of course, Alexander was dead before he was 33. This has also fascinated the generals of the future. But at the practical level, I think they admired the way he had a grip on his men, the way in which he could control circumstances to a certain degree, or at least mould them into making a situation to his liking. After his death, Alexander's empire collapsed, but his legacy proved more durable. His conquests had opened the East to a flood of Western and Greek influence, and the contact between cultures was to have a lasting effect on European and Asian civilization. While Alexander's faults have been largely forgotten, his extraordinary achievements have made him a figure of legend. For over 2,000 years, he has remained the first and foremost of the great commanders.